What's up out there, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Mysterious Huntsman podcast. And just want to give a quick shout out to all the YouTube subscribers. I just hit a thousand today, and I know that doesn't sound like a lot to everyone, but it sure means a lot to me. And thank you so much for listening in and subscribing. And if you do like it, please share with your friends. I would love to just keep this thing growing and get as many listening as possible. So with all that behind us, tonight I have an incredible episode. I've got another account of a dog man or a possible werewolf. And the more I put on here, the more people are coming forward telling me their incredible stories. So tonight, we're going to hear Roy tell a story about how one of these creatures burst out of the bushes and interrupted their basketball game. So let's sit back and listen to Roy's incredible account. Hey, Roy, this is Paul with the Mysterious Huntsman. How are you doing tonight, man? I'm doing pretty good, Paul. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks for asking. And, man, um, I really appreciate you reaching out to me. And um, you have an incredible story of something that happened to you back in the late, great 80s, which is you know my favorite era. But, anyway, uh, it, it happened to you down in New Orleans, which has a lot of... Uh, a mystique surrounding that area in the first place, but um, I'm going to let you just jump into it and uh, let you tell us your encounter. Okay, well, um, I uh, moved down to New Orleans. Well, let me back up. I went to New Orleans initially to help somebody drive uh, to New Orleans. They were moving to New Orleans. And they told me, uh, you know, just help me get down there, help me unload the U-Haul, and I'll send you home on a Continental Trailways bus uh, that Friday. We left, uh, would have been Saturday morning we left. And it took uh, a couple of days to get down there because we, we stopped a couple of times, but... Um, I had actually, uh, shortly before that, went through uh, my first serious breakup in a relationship, and I was dealing with it okay. You know, people deal with things different, uh, but I thought maybe we was going to be together for, you know, quite some time, but that wasn't to be, so I was... Uh, I guess I was broken hearted to a certain extent, but, you know, it, it didn't keep me from doing, you know, the stuff that I normally do, you know, go fishing, play basketball, focus on my football. So it was, you know, summertime when we went down there and we got to Louisiana, got to the place where uh, the lady was moving to and got the U-Haul unloaded and she was asking me uh, if I wanted to, you know, go around and see New Orleans while I was there. And I'm like, well, yeah, I was hoping I wasn't going to just have to, you know, sit here in this department until Friday. So we went out to, she took me to a couple of places to eat. And then we went down to the French quarters. Uh, I think it was Wednesday, possibly Thursday. It was Wednesday. And... And I got down there, and then being from Omaha, Nebraska, you know, little, they said it's a city. I just call it a town that's striving to be a city at that time. And a lot of stuff you see in a big city, you just don't see in a little town. So I've seen, you know, all these bars and people walking around, and plus they walking around drinking alcohol outside. I'm like, well, wait a minute now. And even though I wasn't, quite of legal drinking age then uh I still got something to drink from a vendor on the corner. It was a hurricane and it was a big a big drink. It's thirty two ounces. That was a big drink. So <laughs> of course I was a little tipsy at that time. well I wasn't drunk but I'm gonna say I was I was more than a little tipsy. I wasn't feeling no pain out like that. And <laughs> we went into a couple of uh, clubs. We went to a, a comedy club and a blues club, and nobody carded me. Uh, 
So I got in and, you know, I'm like, you know what? I talked to her when we were uh, walking back to the car. I'm like, I don't want to go back to Omaha. I want to stay down here. And she was like, well, are you sure? She said, you really haven't seen. I'm like, I've seen enough to know that I want to stay longer to explore more. <laughs> so, um, yeah, New Orleans, New Orleans has that effect on people. <laughs> it, 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 it does. It, you know, it's, it was different, you know, I had been to another city before in my life, but it wasn't anything like New Orleans. I had been to Colorado Springs, and it wasn't anything like New Orleans. I'm like, this is it's not the only drawback to being in Louisiana is the mosquitoes. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> you're you're you right. Can get, <laughs> you can find yourself a pine or two low if you stay out too long <laughs> <laughs> down there. But uh, she said, well, you're going to have to get a job. And she said, I thought you was planning on going to school. I said, well, yeah, I'm still going to go to school. Now, when I say school, I'm returning to college. I'm like, yeah, I'm still going to go to school. So she said, well, you're going to have to get a job. I'm like, no problem. I'm like, I'm just going to do both. And I went ahead and uh, filled out my paperwork for to go to school and, you know, get grants and some uh, loans. And I got a job working at Chess King. It was a, a clothing store. Um, they rest in peace. They all of uh, all of them are closed now, but uh, I got a job working at there, working there part time, and I was going to school full time. And life was life was pretty good. I mean, I'm in a different city, and you know, it was kind of lonely at first moving to a, a new city when you don't have any friends or or you know relatives around to talk to. So. I, I made some, you know, some of the guys I played football with. Uh, we, you know, once they find, you know, no, I was new. Of course, there were other people that moved from different states there, so it was mostly those guys that uh, I tended to form a bond with. And I guess I had been working at Chess King for um, three or four weeks. I don't have my journal right here in front of me so to give the exact time. But I guess I say between three and four weeks and they sold m mainly men's clothes, but they also had a small uh, section of the store that was for women. And that was a plus, you know, being young and freshly single, and, you know, women come in the store and, <laughs> you know, uh, I wasn't too big on flirting with, you know, the customers a lot, but, uh, a uh, young lady came in the store one uh, evening, and I I looked at her, and, you know, my ears kind of perked up a little bit, and I was like, oh, you know, my, my uncle told me about women like that. So I, maybe I might have to say something to her. So I went over and asked her if she needed any help with what she was looking at, and she's like, no, I, I think I got it, you know, with, I stood there and I started a little conversation with her, a little light flirting. And by the time she got done shopping and came up to the register, when I got ready to ring her up, I asked her uh, if I could take her out on a date. And she looked at me for, I don't know, two seconds. And she's like, yeah. She said, yeah, we can go out on a date. And I was like, yeah, okay, okay. Let's see what's the, where this going to go. And I said, uh, okay, let me have your your telephone number, your address, and I'll call you and I'll come and pick you up uh, Friday. I met her on a Thursday, and I said, I'll come and pick you up Friday, and, you know, we'll go out and get something to eat, and then if you want to go down in the French quarters or go watch a movie or, you know, maybe go to a nightclub or something, let's do that, and, I should have known something wasn't right when she replied because she said, well, I can't give you my phone number and my mother won't let any men come to the house. And first thing that went through my mind was either she married or she got a boyfriend, even though I had checked both of her hands for a wedding ring and I didn't see one. I figured, okay. I said, well, 
And I asked her, you know, do you got a boy friend? Is that why I can't come? She's like, no, I don't have no boy friend. It's just that my mother doesn't allow me to have uh, any boys or men come to the house looking for me. I said, okay, well, you want to meet somewhere? She said, yeah, there's a park not too far from my house. Why don't we just meet there? Now, at the time, I lived in New Orleans. And she lived in Metairie. Louisiana, which was from my house approximately 2015 and 20 miles. Once I uh, drove out of the city and got on airline highway, it was a straight shot down to get to the park. And I asked my boss before I left that night exactly where I had to go. And she told me, and I drew a little map as she just told me, you know, where I had to make my turns and, and such. And so I Got that information from her, and we closed up and went home, and I came to work next night, and I got off uh, a little bit early so I could go on my date. So I drove out to the, the park, and I had on a casual attire. I didn't have on any, you know, real, you know, sharp threads or anything like that. I had on some shorts and a, a button-up uh short sleeve shirt and I had on some sandals. Now I always I'm really in the city, so I always keep an extra change of clothes and some tennis shoes in the trunk of my car with my fishing pole because I never know where I'd be driving and see a body of water that, you know, well, that looks good. Let me let me grab my pole and go out there and fish, depending on what I had on. Sometimes I already had on clothes I could fish in, but if I didn't then I have a change of clothes in the, the car. So I got out of the, uh, got to the park about five minutes to seven. Maybe I know, well, maybe seven o'clock straight up because I was rushing the last uh, couple of miles I had to go because I wanted to make sure I was there before she got there or right when she pulled up so she wouldn't think that I wasn't going to show up. But there was some guys playing basketball at the park and to describe the park to you, there are a lot of parks in uh, Louisiana that have they have a metal uh, top over them because it rains a lot in Louisiana. You never know when it's gonna rain. You could <laughs> you just never and it never just really, sprinkled it with when it come down it be pouring rain. So I guess in order to make sure people could uh, you know the people that were playing basketball could still stay out when it was raining, they put a lot of covers over some basketball courts. And this one had a cover over it, and it had a little restroom uh, attached to it over right there in the park. So there was some guys playing full-court basketball, and I went sat down on one of the bleachers, and I'm watching them play. And shortly after I got there, I checked my watch. I'm like, okay, I'm here in plenty of time, and I'm looking around to see if she's already in the park, and it's not a really big park, so it didn't take me long to look around, and I went sat down and, this guy walked up to me and uh, asked me if I wanted to play basketball. And I kind of looked down at myself like what I had on and looked at him like, I don't have pros on to play basketball. And no, I said, no, I'm not here to play basketball. I'm uh, waiting for somebody to show up. He said, oh, who is that? I didn't know this guy. So he asked me something like that. I told him, I said, well, I'm, when they get here, you'll see them when they get here. And if you know, know them, then... When you see him, you'll know who I'm waiting for. So he said, oh, okay, all right. Well, he sat down and he introduced himself and he told me his name was Herman. Now, Herman is not his real name. It's like a nickname. And I found out later on why, why he was called Herman. So while we're talking, of uh, these other guys walk up and it was uh, five of us. And they introduced themselves and Nobody gave their their real name. They were giving me like Shorty Mac, one guy named was Diamond, you know, like that. And so I told them my name was Stubb, but that was my nickname. I hope people, you know, would call me that, knew me. So we sitting there talking, and of course they're asking, man, you going to play basketball? I'm like, no, I'm not here to play basketball. I'm going to meet somebody. And of course they say, who are you going to hear? Who are you here to meet? I'm like, when they get here, you see them. 
and you'll know. So it's like, oh, okay, okay. They said, well, you waiting on a girl? I'm like, yeah. They're like, oh, okay. So I'm sitting there talking to them, and their turn to come to play basketball came up. So they went and got on the basketball court and playing, and I'm looking at my watch, and I was about 7.15. 7.15 come and go, 7.30 come and go, 7.45 come and go. So about 10 minutes to 8, I'm like, I can't believe she stood me up. <laughs> I can't believe she stood me up. I drove all the way out of here, and she didn't show up. I'm like, well, you know what? Uh, you now you need to come up with a backup plan on what you're going to do because this time is uh, – you know, he's been sitting here waiting, and it's still early enough for you to find something else to go to. So, um, I'm like, you know what? You're here at the basketball court. Just go ahead and change clothes and uh, go ahead and play basketball with us. And that's what I did. I went and got my clothes out of the trunk and went in the bathroom, changed clothes, put my tennis shoes on, and I waited for the next game, and I got out there and I played basketball. Well, these parks, the lights stay on on Fridays and Saturdays until midnight, and then they cut the lights out in the park. Now, and say you had to leave the park, but you don't have any light in the park, so you can either go home or sit in the dark and talk or, you know, do whatever, but we played until the lights went on. And uh, I asked one of the other guys after we got down playing basketball, I'm like, why do you call uh, Herman Herman? And he said, because his head is so big, it reminds me of Herman the Monster off the Monster Show. Oh, no. <laughs> and I got, a good, I got a good laugh out of that. And uh, Herman, you know, let out a couple of choice words, you know, blank you. <laughs> you know that ain't funny but <laughs> yeah. they, all these guys knew each other since like maybe kindergarten second grade but they had all grew up together so it was all in good fun you know because they, they knew each other quite well so after being in that park I'm thinking I need you know a, a cold beer sound real good because this hot faucet water that I've been drinking that just I need something cold to drink. So I asked them, where's the closest liquor store at? And uh, I think it was Shorty Mac. He said, what, you want some something, some beer or something? I'm like, yeah. He said, well, we're about to walk to the liquor store right now. Why don't you just come and go with us? Now, I guess if I hadn't have been so vain about my car, I could have just put them sweaty dudes in my car and we could have <laughs> drove to the liquor store and I could have avoided what was going to happen next. But I had just got a 1979 Monte Carlo and it had velour seats in it and it was copper with a white top. And it was, I was really proud of that car because I had just, the car I had before was a, 1973 Mercury Marquise, and it was the kind of vehicle it may take you from point A to point B, but you might have to get a jump to get back to point A. So, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, had a, one, I've had a few of those. This one was so much better than that, and I'm like, I'm not about to put these dudes in my car. They've been out here sweating, and they're going to get my feet wet, and I'm like, I'm, I'm just going to walk with them. And I asked him, I'm like, well, how far is it? And they're like, well, we're going to go down here and walk down these railroad tracks and walk down a little ways, and then we're going to cut through this seal, and we'll come out in back of the liquor store. Now, that didn't exactly tell me how far we had to go, but, okay, well, it's within walking distance, so I'm figuring it can't be that far. Now, I just met these guys this night. I didn't know them from Adam. I had never seen them before, talked to them anything. So upon later reflection, they could have been setting me up to rob me, kill me, whatever, on these railroad tracks. I didn't know. But I know there were plenty of witnesses out there that could have, would have said that the last time we seen them, he was with these guys. So there was quite a few people in the park. So, But that didn't cross my mind because 
the time I spent talking to them, they seemed like, you know, normal everyday guys that just trying to get by in life, you know, and stay out of trouble. Of course, like I said, I didn't know them. But I know I had a three fifty seven pistol in the trunk of my car, and if something wasn't right, if I got back to my car, then I could make it right. But <laughs> that did it didn't turn out like that. So we exited out of the park, and you have to walk down the street. Um, not maybe a quarter of a block, and then you see the railroad tracks, and if you had to just cross the tracks and kept going straight, you would actually walk right back to Airline Highway. The park was probably a block off of Airline Highway, which is a busy uh, street in uh, uh, Metairie that runs down to Louisiana. If you stay on it, you could actually go all the way up to the New Orleans uh, airport. But we got on these tracks, and as you enter the tracks, the road kind of sloped away, well, sloped down to where now you're elevated about, I don't know, about three, maybe, maybe four feet, but I'm we'll say maybe closer to three, three and a half feet up in the air just because it's elevated. But on my left, and I, I still don't know the compass directions to this day, so I'll be using my left and my right and backward and forward as reference points. To the left on the corner, there's a, a salvage yard, a small salvage yard. Right next to that building, going forward, is was a tire shop. And then the third building was a small lumber yard. I could actually see, well, once I got down, I could see there were lumber stacked up. But when you enter the, the tracks behind these buildings, there's a single street light behind each building. But they're spaced apart far enough that you can walk and actually walk into the light behind that building. And then when you exit out of that light, you enter an area of, of darkness or gloom, and you got to walk forward a few feet until you get into the next light. And then after you get past that third light, it's just dark down there. Now, if you look to the right, there was a thistle field. And these thistles, for anybody that doesn't know what a thistle is, it's a plant that when it starts growing, it looks like a dandelion. And as it gets taller, it's got one single purple uh, flower on top. But the leaves on these things got needles, and I call them needles. Some people call them thorns, but they got needles on them like a hypodermic, a hypodermic needle because when they stick you, that's what they feel like. Well, these particular thistles were... I'm assuming because of how much rainfall you get in Louisiana. These things were about seven feet tall, maybe a little bit taller than that. But they were so thick, it looked like somebody had planted them there, and they just grew wild, even though this was uh, uh, a wild plant. I don't think anybody planted them things, but I know if you had been in them, you it would have been pretty bad for you as many times as you would have got stuck by those those needles. So when you're on the tracks, and I'm five ten and a half, or well, almost five eleven, I could just see over the tops of some of them, and then yet there were still some in there that I couldn't see over the top of, but I could see houses. There were probably, that field was probably 150 yards I don't think it was feet. I believe it was yards, but it was about 150 yards through that, across that field field. You could see the back of some houses over there. Some of them had the back lights on and, you know, some of them were just dark. Well, we're walking along. We got behind the first building and we're just about to walk into the light and we're walking space apart. There's three guys in the front, two guys in the middle, and then me and Herman were bringing up the rear. And Herman looked at me and he said, hey, Stubb. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, what do you know about babies? And I, you know, I looked at him and <laughs> I had a puzzled look on my face. I'm pretty sure I don't know if he could see it or not, but I had a puzzled look on my face and I'm wondering, how the heck is he asking me about babies? <laughs> I said, I know a little bit about babies, you know, 
I wasn't an expert by no means at that time. You know, but later on in life, of course, I, I'm still not an expert, but I got way more knowledge now than I've had then. But <laughs> I looked at him, and I'm like, well, what do you want to know? He's like, you know, he said, um, now how do you change a diaper? You know, you know, what do you do when they cry all night? You know, stuff like that. And I looked at him, and I'm like, after he asked me about five questions, I'm like, wait, I said, why are you asking me about kids? He said, because my girlfriend's about to have a baby in the next, it's supposed to come this week, but it might come next week. And I'm like, oh, okay. I said, is this your first baby? He said, yeah, well, I got these the nephews that I have babysat and know how to change change diapers and, and uh, stuff like that. So I didn't... Um, I answered as many questions as I could for him. And I told him, I said, first thing you need to do is realize that your life is going to change, but it's it's not going to be anything bad. You're about to be a dad and, you know, just take your time and think about what you're doing and you'll be just fine. And I said, and plus you can always ask your mother any questions that you have that I can't answer. He's like, okay, okay, so... We talked about that for, I don't know, maybe another eight, nine steps. And I was looking, I was looking around and it wasn't that I had an eerie feeling or anything. At least I don't recall that, but I was looking around and I was looking over at the, the back of the junkyard. And he's like, did you see something over there? I'm like, no, nah, I just was looking over there. I said, why? He said, cause it's a dog that be in there and, Sometimes he get out and he, he'll try to bite you. I'm like, oh, yeah. Now, I've seen mean dogs before that they didn't bother me too much. Now, we walking on rocks. I'm like, all these rocks around, I'm not worried about no dog. <laughs> and it was the white rocks that they put on the railroad tracks. Now, of course, we walking and everybody's crunching and, you know, I could hear the dudes in front of us talking. But, I I don't remember any weird smell or, or anything like that. Or like I said, even having a feeling that something was about to happen. I didn't feel eerie at all. I, you know, I wasn't scary, a scary person. I played football um, and loved playing it. I, I, you know, I weighed 225 pounds at the time. I could bitch press 300 pounds and I could squat 500 pounds. So I was in pretty good shape. And plus I ran a, ran a four, four forty at the time. So Man. I could, I could pick them up and put them down, you know, and get out of town <laughs> real quick. I, I wasn't worried about any physical confrontation that I would have had with another human being. I'm gonna go, well, maybe Andre the giant, but <laughs> he wasn't going to catch me. So, <laughs> but I wasn't a scary person. No come. You know, I was the youngest of a family of uh, six kids, and my brothers used to, you know, <laughs> take me through the ringer. So I wasn't scared of another person. It didn't bother me at all. Of course, I didn't look for trouble, but I wasn't going to run from it either. Well, we were walking down the tracks, and we must have walked maybe. We weren't quite behind the tire shop yet. And we were actually entering into a darkened area between them lights. And I looked over to the right. I looked over to the left as I'm walking down the tracks. I looked back to my right and I seen something come out of them thistles and, and jumped up on the tracks. I didn't see exactly what it was at that time. I just knew I seen something big and black come out of them thistles. And it didn't run up on the tracks. It jumped up there. The first thing I did was take off running. Now, the guys in the front must have either seen something or heard something because they started running too. And Herman even took off to run. He, he either tripped and fell 
or he got tripped. I'm not sure. I was on my way out of town. <laughs> and he said, don't leave me. Now, the sounds of his voice when he said that, it must have struck some chord in me to where I could hear something else in his voice. Now, I'm thinking, okay, it's that dog. And he, all them fellas told me, if the dog come running out, just pick up some rocks, start hollering and yelling at it, and throw the rock. So when he said that, I put on my brakes, and I turned around, and as I was spinning around, I bent down, and I grabbed two handfuls of them rocks. And I ran back toward him about five or six steps. Now, when I seen Herman, he's laying on his back, but he's propped up on his elbows. Meaning he's got the uh, upper half of his body raised up because he's propped on his elbows, but he's on his back. And he's looking at this thing over the top of him. And once I took, I may have ran, I know I didn't take 10 steps, so I'm going to say between six and eight. I ran that close, and I had my arm cocked back to throw the rocks, and I had my mouth open, you know, here. And I saw an adult. It was freaking big. To be a dog, even though you can see ears, and it, it's in the dark, so I can't see it clearly. I can see like a silhouette of it, and I'm I'm trying to get my hands to stop shaking. I'm sorry. I, I when I saw that thing, I'm like. What in the hell is that? Of course, it probably was a bit more colorful than that, but what what is that? And I can't, I couldn't, I just, I didn't know what it was. I, I did not know what it was, but I just know it was big and it was looking at Herman and it had its face approximately six to eight inches away from his. I mean, it was really looking at him. And Herman is laying there, and he's looking, and he's not moving. He's not making a sound. He's just looking at And this thing is looking at him, and it's ignoring us. It's not paying us any attention. And, you know, when I stopped, and my arm came down. I guess I dropped the rocks out of my hand, and the thing looked up, and I saw two. The closest color I can give you of the eyes is the color between a full moon when it's that yellow orange, and then you have that bright white full moon. It wasn't either one of those colors totally. It was like if you mixed them and went met right in the middle, it looked like a dead white. But it, it and they weren't glowing. The reason I could see the eyes like that is because of the light from the street light that was uh, illuminating. But there wasn't an internal eye shine. It was because of the the surrounding light that was there. And I'm I'm. I'm looking at it, and my mind is like, what what the hell is that? And I started thinking, that's a monster. That's, that's a monster. Or that's the biggest dog that I've ever seen. And, you know, the other guys had... I guess ran down a little bit and then they stopped and they came back and I'm standing directly in the middle of the tracks. Herman is right in front of me about 
I say between eight, no more than 10 feet away. So I'm close. I can hear this thing breathing. And when it looked at me, it just, it wasn't like an animal looks at a human being. There was something more there. Because when I locked eyes with it, it, it looked at me and then it did a quick scan of the guys that was behind me. Now, I didn't hear them running anymore, so I knew they weren't running or they had either ran out of earshot. At that time, I'm not taking my eyes off this thing to find out where they are. I'm not going to take my eyes off of it. And I started hearing somebody say, what the hell is that? What, you know, then I started hearing all of them. What the hell is that? And I guess they couldn't see it clearly because they must have been lined up on the tracks behind me and I'm standing in the middle. So they would have to either move to my right or to my left to see around me to be able to see it. And I'm, some of them did because that's when they really started. What the hell is that? Of course, it was a little bit more colorful, but uh, I'm just going to say what the hell is that? And Hearn is not moving. He's not, you know, the, it's, it's not doing anything to him, but it had went back to look. Once it did a quick scan of us, it went right back to looking at him, and it was looking him dead in his eyes. I could see that because I was close enough to see it. And I just, I'm still trying to get my mind to identify this thing. What, what, what is that? So one of the guys I was with had a fanny pack on, you know, back, you know, in the eighties and stuff, those were, uh, being worn quite a bit by guys. You can, you know, you put your wallet and your keys and, you know, money and stuff in there or whatever you need to carry around if you had on yeah. uh, sweatpants or gym pants don't have pockets and stuff on them. Hey, I, so I, he had I, one I, on. I still know guys that wear those. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Not that there's anything and, wrong with that. <laughs> right. I mean, <laughs> no. whatever works for you, that's what you got to go with. <laughs> but Sorry about that. Somebody said... Oh, you're fine. Somebody said, don't shoot it. Mm. Now, I later come to find out that this guy had, well, we used to call them Saturday Night Specials. Right. Back then, which, which is, for people that don't know, it's a gun that you can buy from somebody on the street that you don't get a receipt from or any kind of permit, <laughs> and that's your own personal gun. Now, if the police catch you with that gun, depending on what it was used for before you got it, it could cause you a lot of problems, depending on what it was used for. So somebody said, don't shoot it. And he's got a little snub nose 38. Mm. And I'm like, please don't shoot it because I'm standing right here in front of it. That's a, a, a thought that went through my mind because when you see something like this, you get a whole lot of thoughts that go along with what is that? You know, what am I going to do? Am I about to die? Uh, what can I do to get out of this situation? <laughs> a, a whole, but they come real quick and you, you get them and you dismiss them if it's not that perfect thought that comes to your mind on how you going to deal with this situation. And that's where I was at then. I mean, I'm looking and when she looked at me, I didn't realize it at the time, but I urinated on myself just from the, that little quick look that it gave me. And I'm not ashamed to say it. I, I at the time I didn't know. Because I'm still, you know, I'm coming out of shock into, okay, now it's time to figure out what you're going to do. <sighs> Excuse me. And as that thing is looking at Herman, I took a quick survey again 
of my surroundings because those buildings that we were walking behind, they had that tall chain three the barbed wire at the top. Yeah. And I knew noted uh shot that the Hey Roy. Hey Roy, you're breaking up a little bit. Do you have a good service? Yeah, I'm breaking up. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe I got the the phone too close to my mouth. Is that better? Yeah, it is. It is. But no, it sounded like uh, there was just a lot of interference. I don't know if it was on my end or your end. But but go ahead, man. I can hear you fine now. Okay, and um. I looked at that fence and I noticed, as I said, I could get to the top of that building and run across the top and I'd be able to jump, drop down off the front of it and I'd be right next to Airline Highway. Now, you can hear cars going up and down Airline Highway, even though it's approximately maybe 12, 20 at this time, because I know the liquor store closed at 1 o'clock. And they, but they said we had enough time to get there when we left from the park. So I guess I must have took a couple of, I either took one step or two steps in that direction to my right to get ready to run down that hill and hit that fence. Now, you got chewed up on that barbed wire a little bit, but that would have been okay with me as long as I got away from this thing. And it looked at me. Actually, let me back up. That's not exactly how that happened. When somebody said, don't shoot it, that thing looked up and it looked past me. And then it took two steps forward, just two. And that put its upper body into the light to where now I can clearly see it. When I... When it put its hand, and yes, I did say hand, when it put its hand out into that light, and it it reminded me now that I've had all these years to think about it, you know when you watch a lion stalking something, but it's not down on the ground, laying down flat on the ground, it's actually standing up, but it's got its ears back and it's just making that slow steps to try to get closer to wherever before it rushes them, that's reminded me exactly how it moved. The ears were laid back, and when the face came into the light, it didn't have his mouth open, but when a dog snarls at you and he raises up his jaws and you can see his teeth, that's the look that it had on his face. Right then and there, I urinated again. Now, both my bladders are empty. I'm a little bit lighter. I should be able to run a little bit faster, <laughs> is what I'm thinking. But when I took those steps, because I'm looking at this thing, and the head on it was, it had to be 18 inches, maybe 20, 21 inches from side to side. I mean, it it had hair on it. It was covered in hair, but... The hair on the side kind of bushed out just a little bit. You know, it's kind of like a, a Alaskan Malamute, but not as long. You can see the hair may have been two, an inch and a half, two inches long. And it it bushed out, and the teeth on that thing had to be, I'm going to say the canines was pushing three inches. It, it, and the teeth behind it, weren't like a dog's back teeth. All of them were cutting teeth. All of them were the, that I seen were cutting teeth. And I'm like, I'm getting ready to die. I just, there's no coulda, woulda, shoulda, if, maybe. And I'm getting ready to die. And it's not going to be a good death. This thing, just seeing the head, and when I seen the hand, it wasn't like a raccoon. But, you know, I listened to enough to enough description of you know people seeing these things, and I didn't see a raccoon hand. I seen what looked like an oversized human hand with about three inch claws on the end of it, because she laid her hand down, and the claws were curved 
but they weren't wickedly curved, but they would have a slight curve to them to where they could put his whole hand flat on the ground, but the tips of the fingers might be up just a little bit off the ground because of the claws, but they weren't curved like a, 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 I'm trying to think of the best description. They weren't, like I said, wickedly curved where they had a real definitive curve to the end. They were slightly curved, and those were about two and a half, three inches long, and I'm I'm looking at this thing, and I'm... I can't tell you exactly what went through my mind, except for I know the one definitive thought I had was I'm getting ready to die. I'm not going to be able to get out of this one. I don't care how fast you run. What no superhero is going to show up and save you. You about to be dinner. And I stopped hearing the guys because they were still talking the whole time. I stopped hearing everything they were saying. I stopped hearing the traffic that I could hear on airline highway. And later on, I realized the reason I couldn't hear them is because my heart was beating so loud. It was drowning out all sounds. I mean, my heart was really pumping and I, I just couldn't, I didn't know what to do. I honestly, I didn't know what to do. I thought I was going to die. And when she came into the light, she growled. But she wasn't looking at me then. She was, I guess she was looking at whoever had the gun drawn. It wasn't a real loud growl. It was a low growl. But I could feel it in my chest. I don't know if it went from my chest down to my feet or from my feet up to my chest, but I could feel it. But it was, I can't. If I tried to do it, I, I wouldn't even be able to give it justice. Just, I don't think I got the lung capacity to do it, but it was very deep, very scary, and very menacing. But like I said, and it wasn't real long. It was just like, and my whole body just locked up. I couldn't move my arms. I couldn't move my legs, and my mind is telling in my mind is saying, run, 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 and I couldn't move. I couldn't move anything. I'm just, I don't even think I blinked. I'm just looking at this thing, and I had made them steps to go after that, and she looked at me, and I'm looking dead into this thing's eyes, and I got the feeling. I didn't get a message in my head. I just got a feeling from the look that she had on her face, it was, go ahead, try it. I dare you. Try it. Try to run. I dare you. Because hmm. now she's closer to me that she's taking these two steps, and she came forward far enough to where her hindquarters are right over Herman's face. And he still hasn't moved. He hasn't made the sound. He's in the exact same position he was in. And I'm trying to figure out well, not then I wasn't trying to figure it out. Later on, I was trying to figure out, how come he didn't try to get up and run? How come he didn't scream? How come he didn't do anything? He just, the same position, he just locked there. And I, I'm assuming it was from the amount of fear that was going on from seeing that. I know what my mindset was, and I'm assuming that was the mindset with the people that was with me, but they were still, man, what's, what is that? And one dude said, it's a monster. It's a monster. It's a monster. He just kept saying that. And then I hear somebody take off and run. I didn't turn around and look and see because I'm not going to take my eyes off this thing. I'm keeping my eyes glued on it. I want to be able to see if it's going to now come toward me, if it's going to decide that I'm not worth it and run past me to get the other dudes. I just, I had never seen anything like that in my life. And I was not prepared in any way to deal with it. Now, if I had to have my gun with me, yes, 100%, I would have emptied 
them six shots into that thing. I, and that would have been in her head because that was close. The arms on this thing were, the forearms on it were, were bigger than the bicep. I didn't know that at the time because I didn't get a real good, I could see the bicep, I'm sorry, the forearm clearly, but I couldn't quite make out the bi- the size of the bicep. But that bicep had to be close to the size of my calf at the time. Or, well, actually bigger, probably about twice as big as my calves when I used to work out. And that would make them, I couldn't take my hands and try to put them together in an O shape to make my fingertips touch that they would have met around the forearm of this thing. That's how big it was, and it was muscly. Even with the, the hair that it had on it, I could see the muscles that were bunched up because of the weight that she had on it from the position that was in my force. Now, I got a question, if, so, <clears throat> if I can jump in real quick. Yes. I notice you, you keep referring to it as a she. Is there any reason why you think it was a she? I know that it was a she. All right. And um, I'll I'll tell you why and just just give me just a little bit <laughs> more time and I'll tell you how I know it was a she. All right. Well, after it did that, and somebody took off running, I'm standing here looking at it, and I, I can't tell you how much time went by. To me, it seemed like time had stopped. And I noticed I was able to hear again. Even though my heart is still pounding, I, I noticed I was able to hear again because I started hearing traffic. Well, uh, if, if, if you ever had a dog that had fleas and they might be sitting, not, not necessarily right next to you, might be just sitting that somewhere in the room, but uh, when they make that real quick motion and start biting down at the base of their tail around their haunches, because the, they either got bit by a flea or, or something, but it's a real quick movement. They just go from sitting stone still to whip, and they head it down, and you see them, you know, working their, their tail. This thing jumped like that. Real quick, it jumped like that. Now, it didn't leave, the, maybe jump's not the right word. It flinched. But it didn't do the motion I just described. Because I don't know if it had a tail. I've never seen one. But it flinched, and then it looked over to its right, which would have been in the direction that's the that the thistles were in. And then it stood up. And it wasn't a slow, you know, go up. It just went from down on all fours to the next thing. It was standing up. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, (laughs) I I can't believe this. This thing is standing up. Now, the lower half is still in the shadows. Then when I said it came into the light, I could see the upper half of it. But from the way it was, it was crossed over, I couldn't didn't have a clear view of the chest. When it stood up, I seen four breasts. Hmm. I didn't look lower to see if it had, a, you know, like a, a female dog would have got, has eight teeth. I seen four, but I didn't look any lower than that because I'm looking, I'm like, this thing got breasts on it too. They weren't the type of breasts that you would see in a nursing female dog. These were, and they didn't look like they were full of milk. They just looked like firm breasts. And because when it came up, there wasn't a bunch of jiggling or or nothing like that. It just, I seen the move and then it stood up, but it was looking over to the right. It wasn't even paying any attention to us. And it had to be, I'm going to say it would have topped out at nine and a half feet. I don't believe it was quite 10, but definitely over nine feet tall because 
I had just got done playing basketball, and I played basketball for quite a few years. I know a standard basketball rim is 10 feet tall. This thing could have dunked the basketball standing flat-footed without jumping. It could have just reached up over his head and dunked the basketball. And then I got to see how really wide that it was and that it had shoulders and arms. The stomach was flat. I didn't see any, any uh, bulge of, of any type. Um, if I had uh, been a little bit closer and it had abs, I could have told you that it had abs, but I didn't see them. But in somewhere in my mind, I believe it had abs on it. But it was it was big, and that's when I got to see the bicep. That was ridiculously large. It wasn't as big as the forearm, but it still was a whole lot bigger than one I had seen on any human being. And I played football, high school and college, and I've seen some big human individuals, six, seven, six, eight, six, nine, three hundred and twenty, three hundred and thirty pounds. Big guys. Of course they weren't nowhere as cut up as this thing was, but it looked like it had muscles everywhere. The neck was, even the neck was thick. But that head and the ears weren't, you know, I don't recall seeing any tufts of hair on the end of the ears. And, and I looked at it real good. I don't remember seeing any. It had hair on its ears, but it didn't have tufts on the tips. They weren't extremely long, and they didn't sit like on the top of the head, they were more to the side. But the size of the eyes were about big as golf balls, maybe a little bit bigger. I mean, everything about this thing was ridiculously big. And I'm, I've am seen the chest rise and fall as it was breathing, but when it looked over to the right, it looked over there for, I can't tell you how much time, but I know it was longer than it had looked at us. So I took a chance and turned my head and looked over there and I saw six red lights, probably about 60, 60, maybe 70 yards away, but they weren't above the thistles. They were down in there. Now they, The lights that I saw, the best description I could give would be if you took a reflector off a bicycle and you took a a black uh, magic marker and blacked out almost to the very end of the reflector. So you covered up the majority of the red, but not quite all the way. So there would just be a red outline. That's what I saw, just a red outline, but there were lights. And they were stand. They were like in a triangle formation. There was two in the middle, two to the right, and two to the left. And they were about, I'm gonna say, six, six feet in the air. But it was down in the thistles. And later on, as I was replaying this through my mind, one of the replays through my mind out of the many that I had. I just, that didn't make any sense to me if anything about this creature and seeing it made any sense because I've been taught that monsters don't exist from the time I was old enough to know what a monster was. I mean, both my parents and my grandparents told me, monsters aren't real. This is just stuff in books and in Hollywood. But yet I got one about eight feet away from me right now that fortunately is ignoring me. Herman still hasn't moved. <laughs> He's in the exact same position. And I'm like, dude, this is <laughs> later on. It was, that was your turn to run Herman. That was your time to try to get away. And it looked over in the thistles and then it did a slight flex of his hind legs and it jumped off the tracks and it landed about 18 to 20 feet in the thistles and started hauling. And I mean, 
it went extremely fast. It was running straight toward those lights. And it was going so fast that it wasn't mowing those thistles down. They would lay down and then pop right back up like it. she went over them so fast that they didn't even have a chance to, to feel the pressure of her going on them like some, like a when the wind blows something and then it pops back up. I mean, they pop right back up. Once she got, mm, I'm going to say maybe 50 feet, just a rough guesstimate. I can't tell you exactly how far it was, but she got far enough away. First thing I did was run over and uh, Diamond, or was it Shorty Mac? It was one of them two, but they came, everybody came running up, but we was the first ones to get to Herman. And first thing was, Herman, are you okay? Herman, you okay? He's not responding. He's not moving. And he's got this blank look on his face. He had a little bit of slobber coming out of the corner of his mouth. And that was it. But he didn't look at us or anything. He just was looking straight up as if that thing was still over him. And I I was like, come on, man, we got to go. So I grabbed him by one arm and uh, Shorty Mac was grabbed him by his other arm. We pulled him up off the ground, and I put his arm around my shoulder. The other guy did the same thing, and we started going down the tracks. And I'm like, well, I'm following the other dudes, and I'm like, why aren't we going back toward the street? We need to be going back toward the street. That's what I'm, I'm thinking. I didn't say this out loud, but that's what I'm thinking. They was like, well, we're closer to the liquor store. Let's just get up there. Now, we still had to go down past this other light and then go into total darkness. And then we got to go through a pathway that goes through them thistles. Now, I guess with my state of mind at the time, I'm not really thinking that, no, I'm not about to do that. I'm with these dudes and I'm figuring, okay, we all bunch back up together again. Now I'm just going to follow y'all because y'all say it's closer to get to the liquor store than to go back to the park. So let's go with them. But Herner's not really helping us, you know, lift. We drugged him more than he walked. I put it like that. And, we were moving extremely slow, a whole lot slower than I wanted to be moving. I mean, I was ready to go. And I mean, go right then. That, that thought crossed my mind a couple of times, just take his arm from around your neck and run back up the railroad tracks. Of course, that puts you by yourself back on the railroad tracks. So we went down the tracks. We went through this path, and I, I guess they had went through there for so many years that the thistles didn't grow on this patch of land. There was a little bit of grass, but it was mostly just the beaten dirt where you could tell people had been going that way for quite some time. So when we came out of the thistles, we were in back of the liquor store. And of course there was a light on the back of there and we seen the, the clerk's car was back there. And it's about 12, maybe I don't think it was quite 1250, but when we uh, came out of the thistles, we went across the back lot and walked around the side of the building, set Herman down on the little lip outside the store, and that's when I noticed that he had evacuated both of his bowels. And I'm like, okay. So two guys go in the store, and there I can hear them. They, you know, the clerk's standing there looking. He's like, man, can you can you call the police force? And he's like, well, what's what's going on? He's like, man, we just ran into a monster. He immediately looked at him and said, yeah, right. I don't know what you kids <laughs> been drinking or smoking, but make your selections. Come on, pay for them. And so y'all can get out of the store. <laughs> They like seriously, no seriously. I no, swear, to God, I swear. In this posture, please call the police. 
He once again said, I'm not about to put it with your foolishness. It's too close to closing time. I don't know what y'all trying to pull. Either buy something or leave. So they didn't buy anything. They just were like, man, that, that, that's messed up, man. You won't call the police for it. They said, look at my friend out here. And he wouldn't even look at her. He just kept looking at them. Maybe he thought we was trying to pull a, some kind of elaborate uh robbery on him or something. I, I have no idea. I, I really don't. I'm just standing there and I got my hand in Herman's chest because if I had let him go, he would have fell off the ledge. He probably fell flat on his face and, you know, injured himself some more. But he's still not responding. So Sh Diamond comes over, Shorty Matt comes over and says, um, well, man, let, let me look at him. So I, you know, took my hand off his chest and he put his hand on him and he's looking at him and we even gave him a few light slaps through the face. I mean, I, I don't think it was that hard, but well, I don't know when adrenaline was going and everything, maybe it was, but he still didn't respond. So he start brushing at his hair. And he said, because I was getting ready to go into the liquor store and see what I could get done, but the guys were coming out, and uh, the last guy out the store said, well, did you park in the back or did you park in the front? He said, I parked in the back. Why? Now, this guy got an attitude now. He's like, why? He's like, man, there's a monster running around back there. Why don't you at least go move your car while we're here and move it to the front? He's like, yeah, whatever, bye. And then when we came out of the store, he came around and locked the door. Hmm. I go and refocus on Herman, and Shorty Mac is brushing brushing his hair, talking about what is this white stuff in his hair, man? What is this white stuff? So I came over, and I'm like, what? You know, we were gathered around. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, what is this white stuff in his hair right here? Herman got a white circle in his hair in the in the top it's the, on the top and yet but it's yet it's to the side on the left side of his head right above his I'll say right, almost right above his temple and it's completely white now when I met this young man his hair was all black I sat and talked with him I played basketball with him for almost four hours. So I had plenty of time to look at both sides of his head, even the top of his head. When I was standing up and he was sitting down, we was talking, waiting to, waiting to play basketball or playing basketball. He didn't have no white spot in his hair. But I know we couldn't brush it out. I even wet my fingers and rubbed it and nothing. I don't know. I've Since that happened, I've done a little research and found out that Mostly it happened in a paranormal experience, and I guess that probably was one, I, I guess, but he had all black hair when I met him. But I've heard that or read that sometimes you have a paranormal experience that scares you so bad or affects you in some type of way that certain parts of your hair will turn white. I haven't heard anything about your whole head turning white yeah i've heard now, i've heard that too and a lot of the times dealing with a lot of the voodoo or hoodoo stuff uh, now there is one thing i left out and i apologize because what i'm about to tell you i am not 100 percent sure paul I'm going to repeat that. I'm not 100% sure. Okay. But I am in the high 90s on what I saw. When she stood up and she turned and looked to your right, I could have swore there was a gold earring in her ear. I'm not 100% sure, like I said. But I am about 95%. There was a gold hoop earring in her left ear. I don't recall seeing one in the right. 
And the only reason that I seen that is because when she turned her head, the light caught something in her ear and I looked at it. And it looked to me to be a gold hoop earring. Yet I was talking with my girlfriend about it and she said that might have been some kind of tracking device for maybe a tag. I can't discount that because I didn't, you know, get a chance to really go up to it and examine it. But I know I seen a gold flash in her left ear shortly before she jumped back into them thistles. And it really didn't register with me until actually later on when I got home, when I started replaying that event through my head because I was good and shook at this time. I mean, I still got to get Herman home. Now, was it my responsibility to do that? Probably not. But since I didn't leave him on the tracks, I couldn't just leave him and them dudes, you know, right there outside the liquor store. And plus, I'm not going to lie. I didn't want to make that walk back to the park to get to my car by myself. I did not. And we had to take the long way back around, which took approximately 30, almost 45 minutes, because Herman's not really helping us escort him back. We, Like I said, we pretty much was dragging him. Every now and again, he would, you know, kind of shuffle his feet and help us walk. But for the most part, he just was, it was just like dead weight. And you're just trying to, you know, sort support him between two people mm. and get him back. Right. Now, when we got back to the park, I'm like, okay, I got him to the park. Let me get to my gun. And uh, Diamond was helping me this time. And instead of them stopping in the park, we walked right across the park and went across the street and went toward airline highway one house and then they walked up in the yard and we they went up on the porch i said herman down on the porch and leaned him up against the porch railing and one dude was ringing the doorbell and the other guy was was beating on the door now it's after one o'clock it's actually after 1 30 in the morning so i didn't know whose house we was at or anything like that but when uh, the lady came to the door, she had on her night clothes, of course. She's like, who the hell is ringing my doorbell and beating on my door like that? Of course, that's not exactly what she said, but that's what I'm going to say, she said. <laughs> and the first thing, uh, every, they started talking. I wasn't saying anything. I'm just looking. Something's wrong with Herman. Something happened to Herman, okay? I put two and two together. This is Herman's house, and that's Herman's mother's. She's like, what are you talking about? She said, something, something, something happened to Herman. There's one dude is saying that. Everybody else is talking about a monster, a monster, a monster. You know, so she got five, I'm sorry, yeah, five dudes. Something happened to Herman, monster. And, of course, you know, she's got to figure out what's going on. She's like, what the hell is y'all talking about and what's wrong with my baby? Where's Herman? They say he right there. She walked out on the porch. She looked at me. She didn't know me. She didn't say nothing. She didn't ask me who I was or anything. She looked at Herman and she's like, Herman, Herman, you know, she shook him and she's like, what the hell did, what y'all didn't do to my baby? And I didn't say anything to her. I don't know this lady. I didn't say a word. I just, was trying to make sure Herman didn't fall. And then she said, and he done used the bathroom on himself too. What the hell have y'all been doing? You know, the accusation started flying. I, I didn't say anything. I'm, I'm just standing there looking. And of course I had been, look, I know I was looking around. I was looking back over to the park and I looked down the street and I'm looking to see if this thing done followed us. Thank God I didn't see it. But she said, don't nobody go nowhere. I'm getting ready to call the police. As soon as she said that, I leaned Herman back against the railing to while I was hoping that he wouldn't fall. 
and I exited her front yard, and as soon as I hit the street, I ran down the street towards my car. Now, three houses down from Herman, there were some people sitting on the steps, and there were some other people sitting in some chairs on the porch, and they said, what is he running from? I clearly heard him say that as I passed by the house. As soon as I got to my car, I took my key, opened up the trunk, and yes, in front of God and everybody else, I stripped off them wet shorts and them kimmy shoes. I put on the shorts that I had on and jumped into my sandals that I had, and I got in my car. Now, when I got into my car, I started up. When I put it in drive, I floored it. I mean... It went, I, it's almost like I was trying to push it through the floor board of that car because when I left from the curb, my tires were spinning. When I got to the end of the street, there's a stop sign. I didn't even stop. I went straight out in the traffic and I almost hit another car and another one almost hit me because they started honking the horn. I didn't even care at the time. I got home as fast as I could. I went in the house. The first thing I did as soon as I closed the door was slid my sofa in front of the door. I went in the kitchen, unplugged my refrigerator, pushed that out of the kitchen in front of the couch and plugged it back in. And then I went into the bedroom and got my box of bullets down. And I started loading my speed loaders. I had three of them. I loaded them up and I set them there. And then I went back in the kitchen and grabbed my green label Jack Daniels and I poured me a shot. I drunk that, and then I poured another one, and then I just walked back in the bedroom with my glass and that, and I had the door open, and I was sitting on the bed waiting, and I was scared to death. If I had to order the pizza or something, when that pizza guy would have knocked on the door, I probably would have put bullets all around that door frame or maybe shot through the door <laughs> because my hands were shaking so bad. I was really shook because now the replay is starting. Yeah. And I'm thinking. I bet you wish you'd have went fishing earlier. <laughs> <laughs> what I really wish was that when that woman came in the store Thursday, I would have kept my mouth shut and just did <laughs> any talking that I would have did would have just been inside my mind and never passed my list. Right. That's what I really wish. Now, do I know 100% that she was that thing? No, I don't. That's what I was wanting to ask you. I, I never seen her again. I never heard she had my telephone number. I never received a phone call from her. And she never came back into the store. But I was in such a state at the time because I'm trying to figure out what this thing, what, the, what was that? What was the reason? I mean, you get all kind of thoughts go through your head when you have something like that happen. Because I'm in the city. I'm not out in the woods. I'm not walking down some lonely country trail. My car didn't break down on I-10. <laughs> I'm just left from the basketball court, and I'm in the city. I can see houses. Yet I know that if we had to start yelling and screaming louder, even with the yelling that they were doing, asking what the heck that thing was, nobody came out on their back porch. Nobody came down that street to look down the railroad tracks. Nothing. If that junkyard dog had been there, he didn't even start raising cane. Nobody was going to come and help us because if that was going to be, that's the way it would have been, and it didn't happen like that. But I'm trying to figure out what did I, I mean, I had come. I realized I seen a werewolf when she came into the light. Oh, that's what I think it is. But I never heard from that woman again. So I spent the weekend like that. I think I just got up to shower. I don't even think I ate nothing. But I do know I drunk almost that whole fifth of Jack Daniels. I didn't even go to sleep because Monday I was supposed to go to work. And I called off because I wasn't ready to leave the house yet. But I went in Tuesday, uh, and I, I, uh, I hadn't started school yet, so I didn't have to worry about that. But when I went to work, my boss was looking at me. You know, she said, you know, 
hey, Roy, how you doing? I'm like, hi, how are you? But every little sound that I was hearing, I would jump or I would, you know, go investigate. And I guess I had been acting different the whole day. Because before I started school, I was working, I could work in the daytime or sometimes, you know, you, you got to work in clothes. So I did that and I guess probably it was a little bit after lunchtime when she, she walked up to me and she said, Roy, and I looked at her, I'm like, yeah, she's like, what's the matter? And I was like, nothing, nothing. She's like, no, you're not. She, she, she said, I don't know what happened this weekend, but the guy that left out of here Friday is not the dude that showed up Tuesday, basically, is what she said to me. Hmm. And I was like, she said, if you want to talk to me, you can talk to me. Did, did something happen bad on the day? And I just was like, I, I don't want to talk about it. But she kept at me, and she kept at me. She's like, you know, I know there's something bothering you. She said, you can talk to me. I know you don't have no family or friend, really have friends down here. You haven't been here that long. She said, but you can talk to me. Now, the reason I guess she said that is because the majority of the time I worked, I worked with her. And we had built, built a little uh, repertoire where I could we'd talk to her about stuff I did in Omaha, stuff like that. So she wasn't used to me coming in the store, and the only time I said something is when a customer came. So, you know, we usually have a, a running banter going between us. And I wasn't acting like that. So finally, I guess maybe about three hours in, she was like, she just came over to me and stood by the counter, and, she, you know, we, nobody else was in the store. She's like, really? She's like, you can talk to me and tell me what's bothering you. She said, if you're worried about me telling somebody, I'm not going to do that. I, this is between me and you. She said, unless you're about to tell me that you killed somebody, she said, but, and then I can't, you know, I can't keep that to myself. I said, I really don't want to talk about what happened because you're going to think I'm crazy. And she said, why would you say that? I said, you're going to think I'm crazy if I tell you what, about what I've been thinking about. She said, just tell me. And she reached over and she patted my hand and she said, just tell me what's going on. And she said, I can tell something is really bothering you. So I told her. And the whole time I was talking to her, she didn't interrupt me. She didn't ask no questions. She just looked at me and she, I can actually tell you the exact pose that she was in. She had one arm uh, laid on the counter, and she had her other arm resting uh, right next to it. She didn't have her elbow on top of her hand. Was right next and she had her in her hand. When you put your hand in the palm of your hand, and you're on both sides of your face. And she just looked at me. And... Hey, Roy. You're cutting out again. Oh, if it's okay. Sorry about that. It must be that one. I found that one little rough area, I guess, in the <laughs> house. But is this better? Yes, sir. It is. Okay. Um, where did it start breaking up at? Um, you was uh, you were describing her pose. Okay, she had one hand on the counter. And she had her elbow, her other hand, she had her elbow up. It wasn't on top of her hand. It was by her fingers. But when you take your hand and you cup it in your chin, and then you have your fingers up on the side of your face, that's yeah. the posture she was in. So she was, she, very recept her, she was very receptive. Yeah. And she was looking at me. And when I got done talking, she said, Oh. You seen a, excuse me just a minute. Oh, no, man, stop it. <laughs> stop it. I'm sorry about that. Um, and she said, oh, you seen a loop guru. And I looked at her and I said, 
who the hell is Newt Guru? I'm talking about a monster. I'm not talking about some guy. She said, no, a Newt Guru is a werewolf. That's what they call them down here. Yep. Loop -guru. Uh, she didn't make mention of a Rougarou at that time. She just said Loop Guru. And I'm looking at her, I'm like, well, I said, how do you kill him? And she said, well, uh, from what I heard, you have to have some rock salt, some oil, and fire. You know, and I looked at her like, what? She said, that I'm just telling you what I heard. I said, well, what do you do with that? She said, you got to take the rock salt and you throw it on them, and they're supposed to be highly allergic to it. She said, I think it, it burns them or something. She said, but while they're doing that, you throw the oil on them, and then you got to light them on fire. First thing I said was, that's not going to work for me. <laughs> no, that's not going to work. She's like, well, why do you say that? I'm like, just my luck. When I throw the rock salt while it's burning, I'm going to throw this oil on it. And when I go to light this mash to throw it on, the wind going to blow it out. And I'm going to be right back in the situation I was in before. That's not going to work for me. She was like, well, I don't know if it's true or not, but that's what I heard. I'm like, okay, um, is there any other way? to kill him she's like I, I, I guess if you shoot him enough you might can kill him but they they supposed to be a, a evil creature I'm like okay I said okay well I guess I'm gonna have to figure out something other than that she's like well do you think you're gonna see it again I'm like I pray every day and at night that I don't and then she asked me she's like did that girl call you this weekend? I said, no. She said, and she wouldn't give you her telephone number or her address, which I said, no. And she, all she said was, hmm. Now, after our talking to some more people down there, and one thing I found when I was down there that you can talk to four people about uh, paranormal stuff or werewolves in Louisiana and either the second or the third person you talk to will gladly have a conversation with you about loop guru, rougarou, voodoo, uh, spirits and stuff they done seen. Like it's no big thing. I mean, they don't make fun of you or stuff like that. Not to say that I talk to a whole bunch of people, but when I was out and about, I would be at a restaurant or somewhere and uh, the Cajun people and the Creole people that I ran into, they'd be uh, talking about something and I would basically be eavesdropping on the conversation. And they might say something about something weird that happened to them while they was out hunting or what they seen driving down the highway. And I would ask them, what do you think that was? And guy turned, one guy turned to me and said, it was a werewolf. It was a werewolf. And I was like, well, why would you, what makes you think it was a werewolf? He said, them things is thick down here, especially down by the, the, the bayou and then up deep off in the swamps. So basically for the next almost three years, I didn't date. When it started getting dark, I was in the house. I didn't always barricade myself in the house, but I I made sure uh, before the sun was completely down that I was in the house and I had my pistol and I had my Jack Daniels. And the, the, I'm going to tell you the reason why I left instead of staying at Herman's. When that 357 I had, I bought that from a dude on the streets in Omaha. Now, he assured me that it hadn't been used in any crimes to the best of his knowledge. But he didn't buy that gun from, like, the pawn shop or a gun shop. He bought it from somebody else. And But I asked him several times. And it was a guy I knew. I had been knowing him since probably about 10th grade. 
if he had used if that gun had been used in a murder or a crime. He said, nope. It's as far as best of my knowledge is never I never used it in a crime and the person that I got it from never used it in a crime. I'm like, okay, is it stolen? And he said, I don't think so, but I ain't one hundred percent sure. I'm like, okay, well, I just got it for my protection and Hopefully, I'll never have to use it, but if I do have to use it, then I know to get rid of it. Now, I wasn't the type of guy to go out looking for trouble. I wouldn't look to shoot nobody or nothing, but I do know that with everything that happened that night, if the police had been called, when we started telling them the truth about what happened, and with me being from out of state, they would have wanted to search my car and they would have went under the premise of we want to make sure you don't have any hallucinogenic drugs or any illegal drugs in your vehicle. So I couldn't, I couldn't have them do that, but I never went back in that area of town to find out what happened to Herman to what happened to any of them other guys. And, and I'm not going to lie. It's because I was too afraid to do it. Even though I had my gun, I was too afraid to do it because that thing I saw at that time, to the, all the knowledge that I, well, my limited knowledge at the time was not supposed to exist other than in a book. You could get at the library or buy from a bookstore or something that you would see on TV or at the movie theater that was created in Hollywood. So, I got away. I'm not going to tempt fate and go back again and run into this thing. And I've had a couple of people ask me since it happened, well, why didn't you go back? And I've told them the same thing I told you. It's because I was too afraid. Now, it got so bad that I had to call my brother. Well, I called one, my second oldest brother, who was, uh, he was really into martial arts and, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? He would always, his thing was, I want to learn one new thing every day. And I picked that up from him because I started, after talking with him, I found out that he would learn, that was his mission to learn, no matter how big or how small, he wanted to learn one new thing every day. And still to this day, that's what I'd be trying to do. I just need to learn one new thing to add to my knowledge pile. Well, he taught me how to meditate. And we did it over the phone, long distance. Because I was ready to leave out of Louisiana the next day. As soon as I got my next paycheck, even though my vehicle wasn't paid for it yet, I'm ready to go. You no know, ifs, hands, eyes, and buts. But he said, man, you need to stay down there and go to school. You made a commitment to go to school. I'm like, that's right. I said, I can go to school in Brass. He's like, but you made a commitment there to go to school. He said, just stay there and, and go to school. He said, at least do two years. And if you don't think you could do it after that, he said, then you can go ahead and transfer to another school. He said, but you need to stay in school. And as much as I wanted to tell him, you know, you can go to hell with all that. I'm on my way back to Nebraska. <laughs> I stayed. It wasn't easy because, you know, you go into school, especially college, you see a lot of women, young young ladies, and they no longer interested me for at that time and for a while after that because I'm like, last time I tried to talk to a woman, <laughs> the day I pulled the meter, I seen a monster. So I think I'm going to just lay off the women for a while and focus on football and school and my job. And well, that's what I did. Well, I got another question. Did you ever think or did it ever uh, dawn on you? It's, to me, it sounded like this thing, whatever it was, almost focused on Herman. It's like, you know, it's, or, or, or was he just in the back of the line? Did he just get left behind? I, I, well, I've actually thought given both of those a great deal of thought over now. I've had plenty of years to think about it and I've talked to a few people about it and they were, it was after Herman, it wasn't after you. And I also got, uh, she saved you because 
Herman them was planning on doing something to you on them tracks. And of course, the last one was she did that to Herman because he failed or he was last in line. And she, somebody even told me she tripped Herman and was hoping y'all would keep on running away so she could go ahead and run, pick him up and run back in the thistles and eat him. Now, for so my answer to that question is. I felt like after it happened that she, she, you know, one, some days it's, 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 would go along the lines of she, uh, gosh darn it, phone. Sometimes it would go along the lines of, okay, she's after Herman. And then sometime it would be, She's doing that to lure me back to Herman so she can get me. But, you know, that's that's one of the questions I'll never really be able to have a, a good enough answer to satisfy me to. Because that whole, that whole encounter was just so, for one, unexpected. Too just otherworldly to me, but I, you know, Paul, I, I guess if to give you an answer right now, I'd have to say it's because he failed, or, and I'm just trying to be funny here, maybe because she had her face so close to him that she was really nearsighted and really couldn't tell if it was me. Or him, but and I'm just trying to be funny when I say that. <laughs> right. I honestly don't know what the intentions of that yeah that that thing was with him. I would I would have hated to be in his in his shoes when that happened. But you know, nothing nothing you do say or hear can prepare you to have something like that happen to you. And the funniest thing is, uh, somebody said, stuff like that is not supposed to happen to black people. Now, why they said that, you know, <laughs> anybody's guess. Because I'm like, okay, so are you trying to tell me these things is prejudice? Is that where you're going with this? <laughs> it's like, but no, I'm not. I said, that sounds to me like what you're saying, because you're saying this is not supposed to happen to black people. Why not? Well, I've never heard of a, a, a black person having that. I said, maybe nobody black has come out and said that, or you haven't ran across a podcast where that a, a, a black person was uh, recounting their encounter. Well, yeah, yeah, that could be it. She's like, but that just was was really incredible. And you can you can call it what you want. All I know is what happened to me in July in 1981, and it wasn't the night of a full moon. That's the thing that really gets me, because I'm saying this is a werewolf, but with all the research I've done, it doesn't necessarily have to be a full moon. Right. You know? Yeah, that's a, a lot of that's Hollywood versions, and uh, I, I do know that a lot of, I mean, especially when you're fooling with voodoo and hoodoo, and the Rougarou and the Loopgarou, which are kind of the basically known as, it's just a two words of the same thing, but um, a lot of, yeah, it, it's Hollywood that talks about the silver bullets and the full moons. So, I mean, yeah, you're, you've done your homework for sure. I mean, I, I, like I said, I didn't, I haven't even really been able, I hadn't even really been able to find out the stuff that I found out in the last three years over more than 30 years of trying to find answers. And if, you know, if I could have three of them answered, if I could have three questions, three questions about that night answered, I would, it would give me the peace that I, I think that I need dealing with that. One, I need to know, I would like to know if she in fact was that thing that showed up. Two, some of the 
the stuff that I've heard, I don't know if it's true or not, but they say that these things can take some of your soul. And maybe that's why she was looking in the hermit's eyes like that. Okay. Maybe that's why she was looking in the hermit's eyes like that. I don't know if that's true or not, but the third one is if I had shot that creature with that three, with my three fifty seven, if I had had it with me in her eye and killed her, where would I take her to get me a werewolf coat made? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, I probably can't help you with that last question. <laughs> and and the only reason I do that is I have to sometimes say stuff funny like that to try to keep an uh, even kill because <laughs> nothing about it was funny. But I just just to let you know because my mind snapped a little bit that night. I see stuff different now. I see stuff in, in an entirely different light. And some people look at me and be like, "You're crazy." I'm like, "I'm not crazy. I just." I'm say I say weird stuff like okay here's a, a example say me and you are riding down the street and we pass a bus stop there's a guy or a woman standing there digging in her nose and then she's taking the produce that she get out her nose and she pops it in her mouth <laughs> now you might say oh my god that is so gross and disgusting. Me, on the other hand, I'll be looking out and be like, I wonder how many of them she got to eat before she's going to get high blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I mean? It's yeah. just yeah. weird stuff like that pops in my mind, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, Roy, you need to focus. But it, that was the scare, that, the scariest thing that ever happened to me in my life. And if I could just get one of them dudes to contact me, if I could get one to contact me, so that I could find out what happened after them after that night. Did, did one of y'all see it again? Did y'all hear anything? You know, because I checked the news. Well, uh, I, I know you were, newspapers. before we started, I, you know, I know you and I were talking earlier and I mentioned Dark Waters and you know that name and uh, everyone down there knows that name. And, you know, he, he may be um, the one to reach out. And he may have heard about this account through some, maybe some of the other guys. Cause you know, you're, I, I assume that you're no longer in new Orleans, but, um, they probably still talk up. They, I'm sure that still goes on down there. So he's probably the, he's probably the man I would talk to. And, and I can probably try and, and put you in touch with him. He's a really good guy. Yeah. If you could do that, that, that would be great. I'd greatly appreciate that. No, I, I moved all the way across the country. You got away from mosquitoes and werewolves. Yeah, but unfortunately, <laughs> where I live at now, they be talking about skinwalkers and stuff. Oh my goodness! <laughs> hey, that's another show, and I yeah, <laughs> we'll have to talk about that one. <laughs> yeah, because it, it's well, the, some of the stuff I hear about that. I'm like, oh my goodness, where can I go? I mean, <laughs> I haven't seen anything, and I do go fishing again at night. I have when I go out to the big reservoir. I never go by myself, and the person that I go with, where he brings two guns and I bring one, so <laughs> we're 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 well armed. But I haven't seen, heard, smelled anything other than the normal uh, wildlife that's around here. Of course, you know scorpions and rattlesnakes and black widow spiders and <laughs> tarantulas and all that stuff. You you see them while you're out there, but. Nothing uh, bigger than that, and oh, well, other than coyotes, but nothing bigger yeah. than that. And thank goodness, it's just <laughs> this stuff has stayed with me for years. And I thought I had, I thought I had put it away. Like I said, until that one day I was on YouTube and just listening to music. I tried to, listen, you know, go back and listen to some Parliament and uh, oh yeah, Boot, uh, George Clinton, Bootsy Collins. I know all about. Yeah, I was listening to them, and I'm trying to go oh, and some uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire. I just was listening. These uh, the thing was going to the end, and you know, you're on your phone. If you just scroll up with your thumb, then it'll show some more videos. And I've seen a podcast for Sasquatch Chronicles, and 
I was trying to swipe it off the screen, and I guess I fat thumbed it, and it um <laughs> it started playing, and I was away from my phone. I was just doing my Bluetooth, and I'm like, oh man, I said, well, I'm gonna finish smoking my cigarette, and I'll listen to this, and then I'll go back in and go back to the music. And some woman was talking about she was in the woods camping, and something came up to her tent where she heard it out going through her food stuff she had out there in her cooler and she looked out the little screen window and seen something standing on two legs that was covered in hair and she zipped the tent back closed and she had her dog with her and her dog wouldn't go out. She was trying to climb up in her lap and it was a 110 pound German Shepherd and then the thing came up and started sniffing around the tent and Till that's when the dog growled and started barking and she heard it run off. And I'm like, what the heck is this? So yeah. I started searching for, for cryptic stuff. And then I located uh, uh, Dog Man and Commerce Radio. And I started listening to that. And boy, that some of the stuff that's on there make your hair stand up and lay down and stand back up. And yeah, I just I got back on. I'm like, okay, they got podcasts. Maybe I can find out. And I've only heard one other encounter where the person refers to what they saw as a werewolf and it scared me. It, it opened up that door and I'm like, you know what? I got to get this off my chest, but I'm finding that each time I talk about it, it gets easier. And so I know my healing is still going on, but I am still healing from it because it, it really, <laughs> it really took me to, a, a dark place itself just trying to deal with everyday normal everyday stuff because you're always looking around if, you know I'll be sitting somewhere and I'll hear some see some kids playing they might be fighting with sticks and one of them will swing the stick so hard and then the other guy will move the stick and it hit the ground and the stick break I hear that snap and I never heard that sound during the encounter but instead of he's focusing on the kids I start looking around at the house he's looking across the street I'm looking everywhere but at these kids and you know it just it, yeah. it just crippled me to a certain degree that but I'm I'm here to say that I'm I'm doing better I'll probably won't get too much sleep tonight just thinking about it but good god to know that these things exist and so many people want to tell you you're crazy or you tell me you're lying, you didn't see this. I'm like, out of all the things I could be doing or lying about, I could be trying to get a money scheme or something going. You think <laughs> I don't get paid to, you know, to talk about this. I just want people to know that these things are out there and they've been around for a long time, probably longer, way longer than uh, I had my encounter. And you need to be vigilant and make sure you check your surroundings if you your six cents pick in that you need to get somewhere or be somewhere else or don't go down that trail or don't walk down that alley or maybe it's not a good time to walk out of your job to your car because it's dark and it's at the opposite end, the furthest end of the parking lot. Listen to that feeling and don't do it because you never know if yeah. that's going to be the night that you have an encounter. So now, there's a reason. Hearing, there's a reason people have that gut feeling, and uh, you, yeah, you're right. They need to listen to it. And after listening to, uh, I haven't listened to all the episodes that uh, you have on YouTube, but I plan on doing it. But like I said, after listening to that uh, young lady in the UK with what she went through, and it wasn't so much what she saw. It was a big part of it, but the bigger part was how her life changed after that with her moving to a, you know, even uh, fabricating some stuff so she could get out of the household that she was in to go to another household. That just, you know, that was a little extreme, but, you know, when that terror grips you like that, you right. that just shows you willing to do whatever you got to do to get out of that area and you don't never want to go back. So, you know, for the uh, people that listen to uh, my encounter, just remember this world is filled with things that we are taught from an early age doesn't exist. Now, I'm not saying don't not believe your, your parents, but just keep an open mind to the possibility 
that maybe you'll see something that you were told doesn't exist. And if you got a gun, all I'm going to say is if you don't have to shoot it, unless it's, you don't have no other choice, don't shoot it. Just leave the area and leave that thing alone because <laughs> I don't know if that 357 would have did the job. I, I, I would have rather had a bazooka, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, or, just, or, or some rock salt and oil, so. Yeah, and, <laughs> you know, if, if uh, you know, Paul, I just, I just don't know why. I had that encounter. The only thing that really sticks in my mind is it was supposed to be me on my back instead of Herman. You know, when I really think about it, I'm like, that was supposed to be me because normally if somebody stand you up, they'll at least call you to apologize or give you an explanation of why they didn't show up. And I never heard anything from her and I couldn't go to her house and go and knock on the door because I didn't know where she stayed and she wouldn't give me her telephone number. But needless to say, and that has happened to me a couple of times in my life since then, the first thing I said was, you know what, have a good day or have a good evening. May God bless you and, and hold you in his arms. And I just walked <laughs> off. <laughs> I didn't give us no more stuff than that. I, you know, you got a good reason, whatever it is. But I'm not meeting you in no park, nowhere. I'm not meeting you at a restaurant anywhere, I, I'm not meeting you anywhere outside the movie theater. I'm not going to meet you. If you can't give me at least your phone number, then, <laughs> you know, <laughs> these, these, and, you know, for the, uh, thank goodness we, the, we have the community that we have now where we can talk to people and they don't make fun of you. Of course, you know, you still got the, the ones out there to be like, oh, I don't believe a word of it. That's fine. God gives us the ability to make up our mind what we want to believe and disbelieve, and, and that's fine. I, I'm, 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 but, you know, my message is for the people that believe. Just be careful out there, whether you're in the city or the woods, because I've heard that they're both. And should somebody have an encounter, I hope that you're as lucky as me and you just walk away with mental scarring or encounter scarring, as I choose to refer to it. You only have encounter scarring, and nobody that you're with, or you, especially you, don't end up, uh, the only way they can find you is because you've been deposited, you know, a few places in the woods or in the cities, and all they find is a piece of your clothing, or maybe your watch or your earring, or something like that. Yep. <laughs> well, just, man, I tell you, I, I, <clears throat> I appreciate you contacting me, and, um, and coming on and telling your story. I know it, <clears throat> it's taken, you know, a, a lot out of you to tell it, but I, I do think that it helps to speak this out and get it out of your system. And the more you talk about it, I think it's, you know, it's going to help you. And I, I'm definitely going to um, try and get you in contact with dark waters and maybe he can dig around back down in New Orleans some and find these other guys. And maybe, like I said, he's already heard of, this or some of you know through some of the other stories down there but um i I really appreciate you coming on man it it takes a lot of you know to go what you you went through it takes a lot of guts to come out and talk about this now well i appreciate you uh having me on and being able to to talk with me and and uh give me some of your insight on this weirdness that goes on in in our world and uh, taking the time to, uh, you know, uh, reach back out to me after I, uh, initially contacted you and having me on your podcast. I believe that if you keep, uh, doing what you're doing, you're going to help more people because as you said, talking about it, every time I talk about it, it makes it easier. And, um, I'll, uh, be recommending your podcast to my various small circle of friends because I I don't have a big one. I I like to keep it small, you know, in case anything happened. I don't want to have to uh, cycle through a whole bunch of numbers in my phone and figure out, okay, I know this is the dude that showed up, you know, or this woman showed up and it wasn't right. So (laughs) I keep my circle small, but I really appreciate you uh, giving me the time to to talk about this and 
to talk to me. I really appreciate it. And I just want to tell you, thank you very much, sir, for oh, you're, what you're, you're doing. And I wish you uh, many more subscribers to your channel. <laughs> oh, well, I appreciate it. Um, you know, and nobody's going to make any money at this. It's just, I, I told you earlier, I wanted to create this as a safe place for people to tell their story. And, you know, so they don't feel ridiculed or judged or anything, you know, and this is pre-recorded. No, no callers are going to call in and, you know, call you crazy or, you know, now obviously if, if this goes on YouTube or wherever, you're going to have the commenters and the haters and, you know, you just have to look past all the comments. You're going to have good comments. You're going to have negative comments, but you know, nobody has to walk in your shoes, but you at the end of the day. You know, and and what's between you and the good Lord is between you and the good Lord. You know what I'm saying? That's right. And absolutely right. It's just you know, but yeah, I, I no. I mean, the more that comes on here and and tells their story, and I know I know people like to hear these stories, and until it happens to them, and then, then they're you know um, wishing they had never saw it. And I get that. And some people call me crazy because I I will go out on occasion if I'm close enough and research or investigate some of these claims I'll, I'll go to the woods which i probably shouldn't do but i go <clears throat> it's just the former law enforcement in me that wants to find the evidence I, you know i want to find the um the proof in some of these claims and so I, I like to dig in a little deep and go do my own research um but i always heard be careful what you wish for because you just may get it but i'm still i'm still you know, waving, wavering in that thought. And, you know, I don't know if I want to see something, but I kind of do just to, you know, cause here's the deal. Everybody says it's a hoax or this person's lying or this person's crazy, whatever. But, you know, over hundreds of years, thousands of reports from, from, you know, early native Americans, settlers to even, you know, Egyptian days, the Maya, I mean, all of these people, thousands of reports cave dwellings i mean cave drawings everything all of these people can't be lying you know all these people can't be making up things i mean it's something people are seeing something that they can't explain yes you're absolutely right you you, you can't explain it i mean you can describe it but can you really explain it 100 percent to everybody's satisfaction to where now they know what you know or are willing to come on board right. and, and take that trip down that rabbit hole with you. You know, they, my thing is this. If you don't believe, don't believe. You don't even have to listen to the podcast if you don't believe. Or if you just want to listen to it for kicks, go ahead and do it. But if you ever see something like what I saw, similar to what I saw, I'm just going to say right now, it's okay. You don't have to apologize. I understand. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, well, man, I, you're, you're exactly right. They'll get it when they get it. But, uh, man, I'm. I hope I haven't kept you too long. But I greatly appreciate you come on, and I'll let you know when uh, this is going to air. And, uh, man, I wish you the best of luck. And, uh, you know, you've you've got my number. And if you ever need to talk or, or just if something else happens, or if you're running across a skinwalker out there. Feel feel free to give me a shout. <laughs> okay, I most definitely will. And yes, we'll talk again. I just um, whether I'm just calling to see how you're doing, or I got my fingers crossed that I'm not calling you telling you about a skinwalker, but just <laughs> to see how you're doing, and you know, maybe give you an update on me in case my nightmare start again. I just I'm I'm really hoping that don't start again. But I just got a feeling I'm a, I'm gonna have one this week. I already know that, but. I'm prepared for it. I, I deal with it a whole lot better now that it so many years it went by as opposed to when it was uh, more fresh in my mind. I mean, it's going to always be in my mind, and I can st still see that thing as if it happened last night, but it doesn't give me, it doesn't give me quite the, the, the terror that it used to because now that I know that I'm not the only one and it's not like this one or two people that's way more, yeah. well, not way more. Let's maybe talk. There's more than just one or two people. Then in my mind is, is that ease that 
I wasn't the only one that seen it. More people are seeing them, unfortunately, every day. And probably as we speak, and somebody might be having a freaking encounter right now. And, right. Uh, just don't. That's happening. Yeah, just don't let it own you. You know, it, it doesn't. Whatever the case, whatever happened, it doesn't have to own you. You know, say your say your prayers at bedtime, and uh, everything will take care yeah, of but, itself. Then my prayers are they, they come every night. There's not a night go by that I don't uh, thank the Lord for another day and uh, giving me back a little piece of my sanity every day. And uh, I didn't see nothing six to eight hundred pounds. <laughs> Every day that I that I can't find in the grocery store in the meat department. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Well, man, thank you again so much, and uh, just take care, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Okay, sir. Thank you very much, and uh, you have a great evening. And I um, know I kept you later than yours probably used to being up, but uh, sometimes you got to just do what you got to do and you gave me the time that I needed and I really appreciate that oh, any- like I said I, I got your number and I promise not to call you real late at night I'll, <laughs> if I need you I'll, I'll make sure I wait till it's a decent hour to call you I'll have to deal with it unless I'm, I text you and call you about 911 and send them through these coordinates <laughs> <laughs> I hear you well alright man well uh, you take care and I'll talk to you later okay alright see you man Yes, sir. Bye bye. And that's a wrap on another great edition and an extended edition. And I love paying a lot of detail to these encounters. And I appreciate Roy coming on and, and uh, telling us about this almost attack of a Rukuru or a Loop Guru or a Werewolf. Um, pretty much the same name applies, even uh, if you call it a dog man. But uh, thanks again, guys, and um, stay tuned for next week. Got another great guest coming on. And remember, if you'd like to be a guest on the show, please contact me at MysteriousHuntsman at gmail.com or check out my website, MysteriousHuntsman.com. I'm on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and you can hear the podcast anywhere most podcasts um, are played. All right, that's it, guys. Thanks. Talk to you soon, and have a great week.